Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Carl Whitcomb. I'm sure everybody here in here has heard about Dr. Whitcomb. He comes all the way from Oklahoma. So he drove in here last night, he, and he had um, um, dinner with his niece. And today he's here, and he has been here all morning. He has a booth next door as well, so feel free to walk by. There is a lot of information on what he does, okay? So Dr. Carl Whitcomb is actually from, um, he, he's now in Oklahoma, but he's, he was born in Kansas. Uh, he was born and raised on, on farms in southeast Kansas. He has, uh, Dr. Whitcomb has a master's in horticulture from Iowa State University and PhD in horticulture, agri agronomy, and plant ecology from Iowa State University as well. Uh, he was professor at Oklahoma State University until 1985, and now he's president of uh, Lacebark Incorporated. Uh, Dr. Whitcomb created Lacebark as a horticultural research company, and it's located near Stillwell, Oklahoma. The original air, uh, the air root pruning containers, root maker, all that is from Lacebark Incorporated. And, um, uh, he also works, uh, he also um, uh, is very much into developing new cultivars of trees and shrubs, and, and the research also addresses nursery production methods and containers, field, and transplanting uh, into the landscape regarding water chemistry, nutrition. Or, so there's a lot of research going, uh, going on as well. Dr. Whitcomb did not want me to take too much time <laughs> trying to introduce him, so I'll keep it as short as possible, but the, his bio is so long, I have to say at least a few more things. He's written several books, four books to be, um, to be, uh, yeah, I think he's written several books, but four books are, ve are very well read. One of them is Know It and Grow It. And then, of course, there is the plant production containers, and then there is establishment and maintenance of landscape plants, and I think I missed one, but, but all the books are on display in his booth next door, okay? He's won several awards as well, 19, from 1977 to 1999. There are several awards as well. For example, 1987, he won the Outstanding Industry Person Award by the Florida Nursery Association. 1988, he won the Award of Merit from the Garden Writers Association of America. 1993, he was named Fellow of the International Plant Propagator Society. 1999, he was given the Meadows Award by the um, International Plant Propagate Propagators Society. So welcome, Dr. Vitko. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Well, thank you. Good afternoon. How's the volume? About right? Okay. All right. Well, um, what you see is what you get. You know, I, look at, I look at a number of the faces and see that just went right over the head. The problem with getting old is you use phrases that the younger people don't understand. <laughs> that was a Flip Wilson line from probably 35 years ago or 40 years ago. And he would go along, and what you see is what you get. Well, let me show you a couple things. I didn't bring any handouts in here. They're all in the other room. But they're available if you want one. The primary talking topic I'm going to be talking about this afternoon, there's a paper called Growing Trees for City Spaces, how to build a better root system on the tree to grow in those, what I sometimes refer to as idiot holes. You know, those 24-inch square knockouts in the sidewalk. Anyway, there's a paper on that. The other paper that, that we'll get to here in a little bit in, in terms of the slides and further talk is entitled Seedling Development, The Critical First Days. You can modify, if you do it right, you can change the root structure of a seedling on about day three, four, five, and it'll never be the same again. If you miss that opportunity, you can't go back. The I'm an old Kansas farm boy, went to Kansas State, still have a lot of family. Uh, my wife's got a lot of family up in this part of the world. And one of the problems that I, uh, as I was looking through various papers that I've written that I thought might be of help to you, I just stuck several in. This one says Johnson grass. You don't have any problem with Johnson grass, do you? Well, anyway, some aspects of control of Johnson grass. And it applies to other perennial weeds as well. So you're welcome to one of those if you'd like it. You know, I couldn't give a presentation without showing you my twin grandsons. But the title of this paper is Designing Trees for Kids. 
I hate going to a nursery and seeing every tree pruned up six, eight feet tall. A kid can't get in them. When these boys were born, I planted that Siberian elm because they live in southern Wisconsin, and that was one of the few things that I was certain that I had that would make it through their winters, and specifically pruned it and developed it so they could climb in it. The tops of those branches are practically bare of bark from those two boys and the neighbor kids climbing those trees. Kids need to know trees. They'd be better off if they knew trees. There's another paper out there that you're welcome to that's called Practical Landscape Specifications. I mean, again, this is all based on research that's been going on. Well, I've been in a research game since, uh, well, let's just say quite a while. There's a book order form out there if you're interested in any of the books that I've written. There's a paper called Solving Iron Chlorosis Problems. This is incredible. This is one of those things. When I, yeah, when I sleep, I sleep. You know, when I go to bed, within three minutes, four minutes, I'm sound asleep. I don't dream, I don't, you know, none of that other stuff. But when I'm awake, I'm thinking. One of those things that occurred to me about 22 years ago was what if I did this? I'm full of what, are the, what, what would happen if? And I took some chlorotic pin oak trees in alkaline, gooey red clay there in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Tried this treatment on them. The trees are now, instead of being four or five inch trees like they were at the time, they're now 14, 16, 18 inch diameter trees. They're still in that same alkaline, gooey red clay. They've never been treated again from that one treatment. This is pretty amazing. Get one of those if you'd like to try it. My favorite plant is sort of the one that I'm working with at the moment. But one of my favorite plants is crepe myrtle. Legerstromia indica is an incredible plant. There's a sheet out there of the eight cultivars that we have patented and released that are on the market. There's a DVD that's about 20 minutes long that takes you through some of the development processes that we did. This is thanks to my son. I don't do that sort of thing, as you can tell. I use this modern color slide technology. There's a paper called Crepe Myrtle, a Summer Show Off. Few plants will produce more blooms in the summertime than crepe myrtle. And there's another paper there called Northern Crepe Myrtle. How to grow crepe myrtle in zone five, zone six, zone eight, zone four. Yes. There are some folks growing crepe, some of our crepe myrtle in Chicago using this procedure. All the, all the products out there, and I just brought a few of them, but all these things under Rootmaker banner, that Rootmaker is my trademark and all the products that this company out of Huntsville sells are my inventions. So look at those things, you're, and I've got, I've got samples of them out there and you're welcome to take one if you'd like. No root circling, no root girdling, just a fibrous root system from day one. And if you really want some more information, there's some of these DVDs out there. This is about two hours and 20 minutes. It's from a field day I did several years ago. And I'd, I was so focused on this thing. And at some point, again, I have the, I have the great fun of working with, Legina and I have two boys. The oldest son came back and started working with me about 12 years ago. We have a ball. His ideas are different than dad's. And, and he said, you know, you're planning to do this field day, why don't I get so-and-so to videotape this thing? So the, the, the whole thing was about six and a half hours, and he wanted me to edit it. And I said, I'm not gonna edit it, you do it. So he cooked this down to about two hours of all the things that we went over on that day. 
If you wonder how in the world does somebody get in such a crazy position that I'm in at the present time, you can read this little cheap little black book. It costs you five dollars. That's what it costs to print. It's my autobiography. And it takes you through a whole array of things and even a little bit into some of the legal cases that I've gotten involved with. You realize I've been an expert witness in some 200 and 250 cases. I have yet to encounter, don't tell them this, I have yet to encounter a lawyer that knows come here from Sikkim about plant science. I can lead them around by their nose and it's been fun. I'm writing another book. The other book that, that it'll probably be another year or two is called A Speck of Trespass. How brilliant scientists allowed a fungicide to be contaminated with a minuscule amount of the most potent herbicides man has ever made. That's a fun story. The thing that's taken so long is that for every half a page of text, the bottom half of it is footnotes. Because I am documenting every single, this is what this judge said on this date, and here's how you find it if you want to refer to it. Because I know DuPont isn't going to be happy with me when they see that. <laughs> the other book that would probably help you, this is, the, this is the last regular book that I updated. It's called Establishment and Maintenance of Landscape Plants. This is all based on science, research. Not old wives tale, because a whole lot of things that are promoted over and over. I've quit taking all the gardening magazines because I get angry at saying, wait a minute, that's not the way it works at all, darn it. Down at the bottom it says, science, not speculation. <laughs> you ask the plant, and this is a phrase that I use with my students over and over again, let's ask the plant. Well, how's, this, is, how's it going to respond? I don't know, but let's ask the plant. You ask the plant and they'll tell you. you. You expose those plants to three treatments, five treatments, and they will tell you which one they like best. The biggest experiment I've ever done had 720 treatments in it. Consumed about two and a half acres of, of a former student's nursery in Florida. Fabulous. Tremendous amount of information. Thank goodness I, had, I knew a fellow in statistics that was able to analyze, because otherwise the, the human mind can't handle that. But anyway, that's enough about that piece of it. Ah. This is what I call an idiot hole. There we go. All right. Unbelievable that people would, you know, with, with some degree of knowledge, think they could grow a plant in such a thing. But what happens, you know, the, you, know the, you know the drill, and the top dies back, and if it survives at all, it suckers, and it's a mess. Once in a while, there are occasional places where drainage and soils and circumstances were just right, and you get a few trees, and, and then everybody thinks, oh, we can do that in our area. Well, most of the time that's, well, I'll just, I'll clean up my language. It's fiction. <laughs> I have to stop and be careful that way. See, the way I went to college, no one in my family had ever been to college before. Back in those days, I wouldn't talk to anyone. I mean, I... So I stumbled around here and there and yonder, and then how, how was I going to pay for college? So what I ended up doing, I worked on a construction crew for Archer Daniels Midland Company. I would work on that construction crew for 15 months and then go to school at K-State for nine months, and then back to 15 months, and, and it was a con traveling construction crew. Fabulous experience that has come back to assist me time and time and time again. Yeah, I, I, have the, I have the fun every now and then of somebody, in fact, oh, it's probably a year and a half ago now, a guy called up and wanted to order a book. I said, where are you located? He said, well, I'm in M-E-X-I-A, Texas. 
I says, oh, you're in Mahia. I said, which side of town do you live on? You're on the black side of the black soil on the east side of town or on the sandy soil on the west? How in the world would you possibly know that? Well, because I built a feed mill there one time. <laughs> and <laughs> so all that travel has been fun in, in so many ways. I could get sidelight very easy. <laughs> let, me, let me get my pointer out here. I have I've not... <laughs> I've lost most of my enthusiasm for bald and burlap trees. And a part of it is the way they're handled. You can say, well, it works. Look at all the, well, yes. But is it just survival that you're after, or are you after performance and long-term longevity? Well, you read all these things about how short-term the life of many trees are. But see, plants run on energy, just like these lights do, this PA system, your cars, you do. Everything runs on energy. The only difference about the plant is the plants manufacture their own energy through the marvelous process of photosynthesis. Then what do they do with that energy? See, if you take a bald and burlap plant and you bury it in some kind of mulch and all these roots grow out here, you just spend a whole lot of energy growing roots that you're going to lose. I don't want to do that. I'd much rather take that plant, put, let it above ground and do something different with it or at least wait and harvest it as late as I can and then put it above ground and then not put any mulch around it and air prune those roots at the face of that burlap. It's all about energy. And the energy distribution in a plant goes like this. Flowers, fruits, leaves, stems, and roots. Flowers, fruits, leaves, stems, and roots. Flowers and fruits and the productive seeds. What's the number one objective of every organism everywhere, anytime? Reproduce the species, you're darn right. Because if you don't reproduce the species, you're soon known only as a fossil. You gotta reproduce the species. So that's the focus on the flowers and the fruits. All right, then if there's, if there's no flowers and fruits present, or if there's more energy than what those need, then it's leaves, retain energy or they transfer it, transfer it to the stems and finally the root system. We'll say, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. The roots are last to get energy from the leaves? That's right. A plant under stress, and you can do this experimentally, I've done it dozens of times. A plant under stress, the more you stress it, even down to the point where you just take a puncher and start punching holes in, in leaves, you'll start shutting down the root system. And see, it seems backward. You think, well, gosh, it ought, to, it, it, it ought to put more energy into the root system because the roots are what supplies the water and the nutrients that, that the top needs. But the other side of the point is there is no welfare in nature. If you show me a weakness, you're history. So a plant that shows a weakness, let it decline fast, get it out of there and make room for, hopefully, a stronger replacement. But it's all about energy. Another thing that, that, that is not well understood is, you know, if you root prune, this was a part of a bald and burlap plant, but if you root prune or you go through various ways, well, where do these roots grow? Well, the thought is that they grow back from... No, no, no. On almost all species, the new roots that grow out from the side of that ball are right at the face of that cut. Right at that point. What I would rather have is a whole pile of roots back up here. Again, this is Son Andy's handiwork. He said, we need some good pictures, Dad. I said, all right, why don't you get them? He's become more cautious about what he asks about. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I said, all right. So he went down to one of the local nurseries and bought several trees, bald and burlap. I said, all right, here's an oak tree. Here's an oak tree. The stem diameter is about the same size. Let's see what's inside. Hmm. And not a heck of a lot inside that ball of soil. And yet this that came out of this white knit fabric, I mean white fabric container, we call a root trapper, that stops the roots from circling. Look at all the, can you see all those roots? They're just hundreds and hundreds. Can you, be, can you get too many roots? I've never seen anything to suggest that can occur. On the other hand, does every one of those roots become a permanent root to the plant? Probably not. Some of them grow for a while and stall for reasons I can't explain, and others will continue to grow and branch and grow and branch. The, 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 a common question I get, I got it once this morning in there, was, well, but gosh, you, you have all these very fine roots, so the tree isn't going to be supported very well. My answer and argument to that is, if you took a half-inch diameter braided steel cable and a half-inch diameter steel rod, which do you think is stronger? The braided steel cable. Those many individual roots supply much greater anchorage than a few big roots. The other neat thing about this whole process relative to growing trees in limited spaces and, and even all sorts of yards and, and near sidewalks and so forth is no one of these roots is likely to get as big as this big root as it continues to grow. So you get less of the heaving and all these hardscape damaging situations. But that was always in that ball of soil. You know, if, if you could see, if there was a tool that you could take along here and say, there's a ball and burnout tree. I don't want that one. I don't want that. You wouldn't buy very many of them. But you can't see what's in there. So you get suckered in to buying these others. If you're going to improve the root system of trees, you have to start at seed germination. Every seed of every species from anywhere on the planet always starts out with a primary root. The objective of that primary root is to nail that seedling in place, provide access to as much water and nutrients as possible before the top starts growing. To do the other, you know, to do the reverse would be suicide. That primary root plays a key role. Well, but if you take that, this is bur oak, if you plant that on the, on the surface of this four inch deep pot and let that primary root extend down here, the day that the tip of that root gets out there and is exposed to the air, dehydrates and dies, the next day there will be secondary roots produced back up here. It's that fast. But you can't go back. You either do it this way or you live with what I call antiques. Or if you put them in a, in a, in a pot, a, a smooth pot that has a, a flat bottom in it, you know what that root's going to do? Go down there in circles. Tuck this one away. A root grows like a bullet goes. A root will grow until it hits something, be deflected and go in a new direction, just like this. This came down, hit the bottom, it hit here, and it's going to do this routine at the bottom. It's like, but see, if, if you took, if you took a, a steel shell or a steel jacketed shell and fired it in a room with steel walls, what's it going to do? It's going to hit here and ricochet in a new direction, hit, hit there and ricochet in a new direction until the energy is spent. It's exactly what a root does. So if you want to know what's going to happen when it grows over against that, that wall or concrete or whatever it is, there's your answer. And even plants you root from cuttings. Look at this. This is an elm, a lace bark elm cutting stuck down here. At the very bottom of that, there's a lot of less than desirable materials out there on the market. This one, they cut a hole in the middle, but there's a little rib 
about a quarter of an inch wide all around the outside of that hole. See that root? It went down. Zoop. Terrible. Once that root is deformed, it will forever be deformed. Again, there was a lot of information. Well, yeah, we, when we plant it, they're going to straighten back out. It doesn't happen. I dug up way, way too many trees to ever be suckered into that again. And sometimes, this was a nursery in East Texas. A guy had a bunch of two-gallon live oak trees grown from seed. He said, oh, yeah, I grew these myself. All right. I said, well, I've got to do an autopsy on a few of them. I do a lot of autopsies. But look right here. There's one clue right at the very top. See this root? Mm. But you look at, look at that. That's pretty good. But his concern was they had, they had hit and they, he said they just quit growing. He said, no matter what I do, I've even shifted some to seven, ten gallon container and they still don't grow. Look what was inside. There's that root at the very top that you saw a moment ago. They had, the seeds had been germinated in these, what looks like a milker, uh, you know, a tube. Well, it was this diameter, and there was a big opening at the bottom. Well, those roots did all sorts of things, and right there at my pocket knife was where the bottom hole was. Nothing grew out this way, nothing grew out this way. They had become so congested in the middle, Roots need room to function. Simple as that. When they run out of room, you stagnate the process because you restricted the energy production of the top, and there you go. And if you take that and plant it out in the landscape somewhere, it's probably going to be on its side at some point. You can tell from the vehicles back here that's been a while. One of the books that I did is called Know It and Grow It. It's a monster book with loads and loads of photographs. Try to find pictures of trees that you want with no people and no cars in them. Because they date things like crazy. You know, hairstyles and all these other things proves quite a challenge. Yeah, Schumert Oak, or it may have been Northern Red, I'm not sure which now. But here, you know, the seed germination, a day later, down here, a day later, can you see this brown, there's a brown tip at the very bottom? So one day, two days, dehydration of the tip. By the third day when I took these up, it's already started. It's like youngsters. Babies. It's amazing what they can take. It's amazing the versatility and, and the responsiveness. It's the same way. This very young soft tissue is very responsive to secondary root branch development. If you miss that opportunity, you can't go back. This is a southern red oak. Same thing. But you have to do it in such a way. You, you can't just go in there and say, well, I'm, I'm going to grow these in the bed and I'm going to undercut them. Uh-uh, 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 No, 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 no. You cut it. Look right here. This was air prune, and then here came another one and another one. There are three or four primary roots trying to reestablish. It will attempt to redevelop that tap root, and you're kind of back to square one. Plus, if you cut that open, what have you done? You cut your finger and just say, well, so what? No, you normally do something and put a Band-Aid on it or some Neosporin is what I keep around. Because that open wound is an ideal opportunity for colonization by whatever pathogens that's in the neighborhood. Now, what's the objective of the pathogen? To find a place to have lunch and reproduce the species, the same as for everybody else. And so you creating open wounds there is not good. What you see, this happens to come out of an 18-cell root maker tray. You look at the outside, and you say, well, that's it. Yeah, it looks pretty fair, but look what's inside. It's what's inside that counts. The more roots, the better. Think of it this way. One root tip, and the bulk of the absorption of water and nutrients occurs right at these white root tips out here. 
One root tip can absorb X amount of water and nutrients and supply the top per hour, per day, per week, whatever. But if you have 50 root tips, wow. If you have 500 root tips, oh, bigger wow. It all goes off in a positive way. I did this just, you know, I had not actually made this comparison until, oh, about four years ago. I was asked to give a talk out uh, Far West show in Portland, Oregon. And I was curious, these are catalpa. I use catalpa as a test plant a lot. It's easy to grow, it grows very uniform. It's about as aggressive, if not more so than an oak tree. And the roots are white, so they show up when you photograph them. Whereas those roots as, of the oaks, as they age a little bit, they turn tan, and it's hard to tell the roots from the mix and sand or whatever else. So anyway, but these were this size out of the, well, I have an 18 cell root maker tray. And I, I transplanted some, well, I actually transplanted these and then four days later these and then four days later these and then these is what, this is what came out of the tray. That's 12 days of root growth. I used to joke in class that I would ultimately like to be able to grow a plant in such a way that all I have to do is, do, is plant it green side up. We're very, very close. It's all about energy. It's root development. They, all this garbage that's sold to you, marketed to you when you plant things. So you put this on, you put this fertilizer on, it'll make the roots grow. Well, after some period of time, that's probably true. But in the short-term establishment phase, it has no effect at all. The energy has to be already in that tissue. You can't wait. You plant it. You can't wait for the nutrients to be absorbed, sent up to the leaves. The leaves manufacture the energy, come back down. By then, your days, weeks, or something down the road. If you want to be able to plant it in such a way that you get this tremendous amount of root growth, the energy has to already be there at the time you put it in the ground. I bet you could identify that plant because you've never seen a, root, a red bud with a root system like that. Most red buds have, you know, there's a little, a little carrot and five, five secondary branches off of it because that's all you get with the old bare root garbage. I'm letting my bias show, aren't I? <laughs> I've been doing this since. You know, as an old farm kid, I used to transplant things and, and grow things, and then I got into the research game, and it's been a blast, absolute fun. One of the things I look back on was um, stumbling into Iowa State University, getting a super guy as a major professor, ending up in a class of a phenomenal statistics professor that had a little, little short Englishman that had spent a bunch of time in Kenya at some British outpost and loads of practical experience. I look back and think, oh, thank you, Dr. Jowett. You know, all those experiences and things that help you build stronger experiments and and uh, design them better and make improvements. But that's a phenomenal redbud root system. If you plant, if somebody would reach around there, I don't think that's in focus. Or my, if somebody put something in my coffee at lunch. There you go, that's better. Uh, but if you, if you grow something in these sleeves, these things are fairly popular. If you grow it in here and then tra transplant it out, look where the roots grow. They grew straight down. I don't want them down there. Where's the best growing conditions in the soil? In the top four, six, eight inches? It's up here. To aim those roots down there, wait a minute. I'm missing out on a viable opportunity. As opposed to if I grew it in this, then I get roots growing in all directions as well as down. And that's the whole idea. And if you see a plant that you see, you see a crack around, it's been transplanted, it's growing all right, but you see this, you know it's a, a water and not, and it's not going to do very well. Ah, do it again, please. Thank you. Yeah. 
Old smooth round containers. Wow. I'd like to take them all and make bumper blocks for parking lots or something else useful out of them. See, I'm so old, I go back to when plastic pots first became used. I, went to, I, went, I left Iowa State and went to the University of Florida in 1967. At that time, they were using what they call food cans. Uh, a, a number 10 food can is about the size of a one gallon container. They would punch four or five holes in the bottom and dip the whole container in some kind of sloppy paint, let it dry, and then plant into it. To get the plant out of there, you had to have a special can cutter. And you talk about nasty. Those cut edges of that metal, wow. And the roots just circled like everything. Then we got plastic pots. They didn't last but six months, eight months, and then they're all falling apart. But nonetheless, plastic pots. And everybody thought, well, once I take that out of there and plant it, those roots are going to go back in a normal fashion. It didn't happen. And there were a lot of trees from that vintage that grew a while. And here came, long before Hurricane Andrew, some other good wind came along, and they got to start over. But if you divide, you know, but all that is history, see, in background. If I interrupt that root that's coming around here at this point, and it either hits here and goes down to an opening, or hits here or some other way, when it gets to that opening, I'm going to dehydrate that root tip and make it branch. And it does. It's phenomenal. So this is a three-gallon root maker plant. You plant that thing out of there, and there's roots growing in every conceivable direction. And we can go further. This is actually the last patent I obtained. I applied for it in 19, I mean 2001. I got it last August. <clears throat> there are some dumb patent examiners. <laughs> but I won. This is a fabric that is coated white on the outside. By having this white on the outside, I dropped the summer temperature of the sidewall of that container about 20 to 25 degrees. Huge difference. Temperature is the number one enemy of growing plants in containers. The optimum temperature for root growth for many species in this neighborhood of, oh, the upper 60s to low 80s. Black plastic containers exposed to the sun, 120 degrees is not uncommon. 130 I've seen. You say, well, yeah, but I'm not, you know, you start arguing. Or the naysayers, oh, well, that doesn't matter. How long do you think if you took a black plastic container and set that out in the sun in June, July, August, September, October, how long do you think the side wall of that pot has to be exposed to full sun to kill the roots on that side. Let's ask the plant. So we did. We grew a whole series of plants, and they were surrounded by two by four, I mean two by twelves, up to the top of the pot and wood strips. The top. There was no sun hitting those containers all season long. And then in September, we had no idea. You know, we, we took them out of there and exposed them to full sun for 15 minutes, put them back. 30 minutes, put them back. An hour, I think the longest we went was four hours. In 15 minutes, the roots on that sunny side of the container were dead. So if a plant is grown in a container at a nursery and one side gets exposed to the sun, then it's picked up, well, we're going to get this order ready. Your order gets picked up and set on a loading dock, and another side gets exposed to the sun. Then you get it, and it's unloaded at the landscape job, and maybe the other side gets exposed to the sun. You say, damn, I wonder why those trees died. It can be that dramatic. So heat is lethal on roots. This is the same material on the bottom as on the sides. This is not my, fabric, my favorite anymore. 
fact, I've got one out there. Um, these hold water extremely well. You don't have to water them as often, which is great. And for something that likes lot, lots of water, they're happy. But what I was seeing with red buds and a few other species that don't really like extra water. So what, we, what I had them do, I said, well, see if you can make this to where about an inch and a half or two inch strip around the bottom of this vertical wall is not coated. That worked great. So the bottom of the container is always where it's wettest. So down there where it tends to be too wet, we, we encourage water exit and, and dry out. Up here where it tends to be drier, we conserve water. It's a neat product, amazing. When those roots grow out and hit that side wall, yeah, again, there's, there's fabric on the inside and this is a coating on the outside. Well, one of the things that took me a long time is people, oh, you, you've, you, ultraviolet light is such a lethal thing to a plastic surface, any surface. I had to go back and figure out the chemistry and say, look, let's make plastic this way or add these things to the plastic to get it to tolerate the ultraviolet light more. And once we got to that point, then we began to coat these fabrics in various ways and one thing led to another. But when a root grows out and hits that fabric, the tip will extend into that fabric just shortly, a very short bit. And then when the tip of that root can no longer extend, it'll cause it to branch just as if I air pruned it. It's not as fast, but it works in exactly the same way. So here was a root that came out. At some point here, it hit the fabric, and then it branched and then these are going to hit the fabric. You can, again, you can produce a tremendous amount of fibrous roots without any root circling. It's great. How many roots? That's about a four inch diameter. That happens to be a Chinese pistache tree, but we can do it with oaks and elms and you name it. How many roots? I don't know. Naively, several times I've thought, you know, I want to do this experiment and, and then count the number of roots. I end up just writing down lots. I, I have actually done some things where I, where I took a two inch square piece of cardboard and randomly placed it here and there and counted the number of roots. But even that's a challenge. What's up here, got to have support down here. This is part of that field day, that, uh, that root maker DVD I simply cut the side of that white container, added a piece of fabric, and made a bulge out here 14 days before the field day. All that root growth is 14 days. See. It's all about energy. It's about those roots being there. If all that root has to do when you plant it is extend, that's a quick response. If it has to if, if root buds have to form and then those root buds ext start extending, that can be weeks. It's interesting to take a chainsaw and cut into those root balls. You get one cut with one chain. Because I, the, the, the mix that I use has sand in it. You want to make another cut, you get another chain. So you don't do this too often. But it's just masses of fibrous roots. Some of these will stagnate. Hundreds of thousands will grow out here in various directions. This is the other new product, one of those things that sitting there drinking coffee one morning, I thought, well, what if? What if we designed this sidewall of this container with these little funnels that project out? And I've got a sample of this over there, too. But this, this, these are one inch squares. Each, each one of those things is an inch square. And these little funnels extend out about three quarters of an inch. So any root that grows out and hits that side wall gets directed in one of those funnels. When it gets to the tip of the funnel, it dehydrates and dies and it branches. Now, one of the, th one of the things, uh, oh, I didn't bring that paper. I should have. It's online. If you want, if you want to read, 50, 60% of what I've written in various papers, 
go online to lacebarkinc.com, and Lacebark is on all that stuff. Lacebarkinc.com and look under papers or publications. My son keeps that up to date. And there's an article in there called The Four Inch Rule. And the four inch rule is that if I prune a tip of a root here, how far branch back, back from that point of air pruning does that root make secondary root branches? It's about four inches. Some species have had more, not many less, but about four inches. So if, if, the, if a root grows out here and is pruned back in there four inches, it's branching which means that root system is less vulnerable to heat and less vulnerable to cold because instead of all being pressed against that sidewall like a smooth pot, it's all branched back, 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 back. That's what it looks like when you take the unit off. And these things you can use them over and over and over. I was up here near Chicago, um, a large nursery just south of Midway Airport. I've worked with, I've, I've known Connor for 25 years, I suppose. Some of the very first ones and, and an earlier version of this that I sold him 20 years ago, he's still using over and over and over. He's still one of the best buys I've ever made. You have to know Connor. But this is what that looks like. See, it's almost flat on the bottom, or in fact, it is, it is horizontal, and it slopes down here so any root that hits this thing, it grows out. This root tip was previously right here, is as good as I could find a photograph. And then when this air prunes, branch, 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 all the way back inside there. You want to move them? Put a strap on the trunk and move them. It's easy to do. July here. If you've got a good root system on there, the only thing I do that's different is I double wrap that strap. Instead of just going around once and choking it, I make the strap into a loop, then take that loop around the tree and go back through it. So I've got twice as much gripping surface. See, there's one piece here you can barely see and another one down here. And in a number of these things, we have taken off this root builder material and simply white stretch wrap, white stretch wrap, not clear stretch wrap, not black stretch wrap. You put clear stretch wrap on there, and what you create, any little irregularity there, you create little miniature greenhouses. We all know about the greenhouse effect, how accentuated the heat it is. If you put black on there, anything pressing against that black, you accelerate the heating. But that nice white reflects it back out. We, we, did a whole, we gave a whole series of trees from some of our, ex, our experiments to a, a children's hospital in Oklahoma City. And this is the way we prepared them to ship. And according to Dennis, they didn't lose a tree. And some of these were five inch, six inch diameter oaks. This is what it comes down to. Water and nutrients absorbed at the tip of the root are just back of that tip, a very short distance. But the water and nutrients are sent up to the leaves. The leaves are, you know, the photosynthesis mechanism. You manufacture sugars. And then if there's enough to go around, finally some get back, gets back down here. It's all about energy. This was a tree that we, we grew. This happens to be a southern magnolia. Uh, that doesn't exactly do well here, but nonetheless, uh, southern magnolia, when the root ball was planted, that's my, that's my pen right there. You can see it, it was about a 14 inch diameter root ball on a four inch diameter tree. You say, no, 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 you can't do that. Sure you can. Well, look what happened a month later. We just simply dug a hole with a backhoe out here and started washing away. All those roots are a month. 
if you really look at the whole big picture and say, how much am I spending to go back and water those plants again and again and again and again until I finally get them established when I can do it. I mean, that tree you could walk away from. Weeks before you could walk away from it, and it's going to survive with that excellent root system. I've pulled them out. We've dug them up. This is a river birch. Just loads and loads and loads of roots. That's the key to the game. This one I did just for fun. I do a lot of things for fun. I have a lot of fun. This is my son, Benjamin. He's the cello professor up at Wisconsin now. This was in a container that was 12 inches in diameter, about 12 inches tall. Benjamin's about 5'9". I picked up this tree horizontally, carried it from a trailer back up here over and set it in a hole. I said, Benjamin, hold the tree up. I took the picture and then we backfilled and yeah, I had to stake it. That tree, if you were to come to Stillwater today or sometime, you'd look out my office window and you'd see that tree and it's now about eight inch stem diameter. 12 inch root ball. Four inch diameter stem, 12 inch root ball, 12 inches deep. We have just scratched the surface in terms of improvements, in terms of utilizing this energy distribution and, and root system and, and other improvements and the nutritional aspects of it as well. Wow. Had to show you a crepe myrtle. This, to the best of my knowledge, is the most cold hardy crepe myrtle around. If you want to try one, this is pink velour. I get responses, you know, we've got probably 200 licensed growers to propagate these things from coast to coast and, and I get comments back about er, the rest of them died but pink velour survived. It's worth a, it's worth a try. Uh, you know, clear up north of Philadelphia, yeah, some pretty hostile winters up there. But pink velour is a sh bright shrill pink. The new foliage comes out purple and of course it's growing in a root trapper. But the other thing those white root trappers do great, and I've done now for the last five years I suppose, if you look very closely, you can see that white container down there. Patio plants, deck plants, if I'm not losing water out through the sidewall of that pot, I don't have to water the plant as often. Well, yeah, I'm sort of like the, not quite like the cobbler's kids has no shoes, but I'm like the horticulturist that doesn't remember to water things. So this has really made a world of difference. And I've done all sorts of things in there. And they start off and boy, as the season grows, but it's lower temperature here, reduced water evaporation, and you get a lot of happy plants. That's dynamite. That's red rocket. Sometimes we get tops of red rockets where the base of one of these flower clusters from here to the tip will be as much as 24 inches. Just massive cherry red. And it's almost as cold hardy as is uh, pink velour. This is Rhapsody in Pink. This is the newest one that we put on the market about four years ago. If you want to try, a, try one, if you can find them, because there's green leaf and various other nurseries are, are really getting into growing this one. It has some unique features about it. The new growth, the light is such you can't see it, but the new growth on Rhapsody in Pink is purple, like a purple leaf plum or barberry or something like that. So you get a color contrast with green foliage in the landscape when it first leaves out, produces leaves, I should say. The other neat thing about it is, and that would apply to you, you're in this geography, Rhapsody in Pink, where I am in north central Oklahoma, will be in full bloom, significant flower show, three, three and a half weeks before the others, which means it doesn't take as much heat to get it triggered to bloom. 
and I, one of my test plots for these crepe myrtles had been in Topeka, uh, my, my sister-in-law's place. You know, why not? And she's interested in plants too. But I haven't, I haven't planted any of those there. But I know they will bloom earlier. It's sterile, it produces no seeds. But the neat thing about it is that was totally unexpected, but since then we've made some progress otherwise. It will send up a panicle of blooms. There comes another panicle and another panicle. When that panicle of blooms, the flowers age and finally drop, and the flowers stay attractive much longer because they're sterile. They're not producing seeds, see? So all the energy stays in the flower. When those flowers finally drop off of that first panicle, immediately it starts forming new flower buds where the old flowers were. So this thing, once it starts blooming, for us in late June, it's a constant flower show till frost. No roller coaster ride at all. It's worth a try. Now every crepe myrtle that I have developed, every one of that I have grown, and that's roughly a half a million seedlings, are all descendants from one old plant. They used to be downtown, near downtown Stillwater City Hall. That's where I got my first seeds. Every seed can come from there, except for one batch from at China that we found to be very inferior. So, but from that first plant, now think this one through. From that first plant back over here where I collected those first seeds in the fall of 1985, we've grown one generation, took the best plants out of there, a second generation, a third generation. Some of the plants that Andy and I planted in the field last June and July were 17 generations downstream from the original parent. And each, of course, each generation we're selecting for other features and traits that we are interested in and so forth. So 17 generations. Where were your ancestors 17 generations ago? Still scratching on the walls of caves in France or I don't know, wherever it happened to be. But anyway, it gives you an idea. And with that, that's the last of the slides. If somebody has a question, I'll be glad to try to answer it. Let me turn the lights back up. Yeah. Okay, yes. Well, what, what, I, what I do, and I propagate them in here, either from a seed or a cutting. Again, I want the most fiber through system I can get. So I go from here to a 10-gallon container or something. So, so like that plant that we saw, that patio plant we saw went from seed? Mm -hmm. Yes, or from cuttings. You know, I've got a couple of varieties of tomatoes that I particularly like. All right, last fall... I took 10 cuttings off of each of those tomato plants, rooted them in the greenhouse, and they're in one gallon containers. This spring I'll propagate some more of those. Tomatoes root like weeds, and you can keep that particular genetic strain with no change on and on and on. But cuttings work great. Uh, thank goodness for good mist systems and solenoids. Wow. That's allowed us to do so many things. Not everything, but many things. Other question? Yes, Prof? Yes, Prof? Oh, I thought you would have something question. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? I, need, I, I, I don't hear very well. One of the things you designed, it was black on the outside? With, with all those little networks? Why was that not white? Do you want, you want it to die back four inches? Because it's, it's polyethylene that is thermoformed, and we can't do it. <laughs> we can't do it with the white. See, the other material, that, those other white containers, that's a black fabric 
that then that goes through a roller and this three mils of this special polyethylene goes on the outside. The only reason containers are, conventional containers are black, a few are green and a few are other colors, but black is the least affected color by ultraviolet light. As ultraviolet light goes through that plastic, it's literally tearing up those molecules. And it's, 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 it's also a problem that's coming back to haunt some of these people that are producing various plants in, in various colored containers. Those light colored containers, they don't last very long. They've made some improvements, but... And see, so the flip side, I would say, well, why don't you just make a, pla a, a, a pot completely out of white? We did that. Years ago, we did that. If you grow a plant in a completely white container, and I'm sure they're saying it with some of these other colored as well, and you're watering and, and the plants have plenty of fertilizer and so forth, and you knock that plant out of there, what do you think you see? You see a green algal slime that you cannot believe. That algae will outcompete the roots, the tips of the roots. So Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about your coffee. <laughs> you were done with it, pardon me. Your fabric, that lets enough air go through so you don't have the algae problem? No. No, because it's black on the inside, see? Yeah. The black on the inside and white on the outside, that's good. Yeah. Anyone else? If you want to look at, look at the books, if you want any of the, the handouts, they're over in the other room. I... I brought 70 or 75, so there should be enough for everybody. If you want one, feel free. Same way with the DVDs, so on. Yeah. You bring in that material? Yeah, there's some samples over there. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Carl Whitcomb. I'm sure everybody here in here has heard about Dr. Whitcomb. He comes all the way from Oklahoma, so he drove in here last night. He, and he had um, um, dinner with his niece. And today he's here, and he has been here all morning. He has a booth next door as well, so feel free to walk by. There is a lot of information on what he does, okay? So Dr. Carl Whitcomb is actually from, um, he, he's now in Oklahoma, but he's, he was born in Kansas. Uh, he was born and raised on, on farms in southeast Kansas. He has, uh, Dr. Whitcomb has a master's in horticulture from Iowa State University and PhD in horticulture, agri agronomy, and plant ecology from Iowa State University as well. Uh, he was professor at Oklahoma State University until 1985, and now he's president of uh, Lace Bark Incorporated. Uh, Dr. Whitcomb created Lace Bark as a horticultural research company, and it's located near Stillwell, Oklahoma. The original air, uh, the air root pruning containers, root maker, all that is from Lace Bark Incorporated. And um, uh, he also works, uh, he, he also um, de uh, is very much into developing new cultivars of trees and shrubs. And, he, and the research also addresses nursery production methods and containers, field and transplanting uh, into the landscape regarding water chemistry, nutrition. Or, so there's a lot of research growing, uh, going on as well. Dr. Whitcomb did not want me to take too much time <laughs> trying to introduce him. So I'll keep it as short as possible. But the, his bio is so long, I have to say at least a few more things. He's written several books, four books to be... Um, to be talking about twin grandsons. But the title of this paper is Designing Trees for Kids. I hate going to a nursery and seeing every tree pruned up six, eight feet tall. A kid can't get in them. When these boys were born, I planted that Siberian elm because they live in southern Wisconsin, and that was one of the few things that I was certain that I had that would make it through their winters and specifically pruned it and developed it so they could climb in it. The tops of those branches are practically bare of bark from those two boys and the neighbor kids climbing those trees. Kids need to know trees. They'd be better off if they knew trees. There's another paper out there that you're welcome to that's called Practical Landscape Specifications. I mean, again, this is all based on research that's been going on. Well, I've been in a research game since, uh, well, let's just say quite a while. There's a book order form out there if you're interested in any of the 
books that I've written. There's a paper called Solving Iron Chlorosis Problems. This is incredible. This is one of those things. When I, yeah, when I sleep, I sleep. You know, when I go to bed within three minutes, four minutes, I'm sound. Uh, yeah, I think he's written several books, but four books are very well read. One of them is Know It and Grow It. Then, of course, there is the plant production containers. And then there is establishment and maintenance of landscape plants. And I think I missed one. But, but all the books are on display in his booth next door. Okay. He's won several awards as well, 19, from 1977 to 1999. There are several awards as well. For example, 1987, he won the Outstanding Industry Person Award by the Florida Nursery Association. 1988, he won the Award of Merit from the Garden Writers Association of America. 1993, he was named Fellow of the International Plant Propagator Society. 1999, he was given the Meadows Award by the um, International Plant Propagat Propagators Society. So welcome, Dr. Vitko. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Well, thank you. Good afternoon. How's the volume? About right? OK. All right. Well, um, what you see is what you get. You know, I, look at, I look at a number of the faces and see that just went right over the head. The problem with getting old is you use phrases that the younger people don't understand. <laughs> that was a Flip Wilson line from probably 35 years ago or 40 years ago. And he would go along, and what you see is what you get. Well, let me show you a couple things. I didn't bring any handouts in here. Honestly, I don't dream. I don't, you know, none of that other stuff. But when I'm awake, I'm thinking. One of those things that occurred to me about 22 years ago was, what if I did this? I'm full of what are the, what, what would happen if? And I took some chlorotic pin oak trees in alkaline, gooey red clay there in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Tried this treatment on them. The trees are now, instead of being four or five inch trees like they were at the time, they're now 14, 16, 18 inch diameter trees. They're still in that same alkaline, gooey red clay. They've never been treated again from that one treatment. This is pretty amazing. Get one of those if you'd like to try it. My favorite plant is sort of the one that I'm working with at the moment. But one of my favorite plants is crepe myrtle. Legerstromia indica is an incredible plant. There's a sheet out there of the eight cultivars that we have patented and released that are on the market. There's a DVD that's about 20 minutes long that takes you through some of the development processes that we did. This is thanks to my son. I don't do that sort of thing, as you can tell. I use this modern color slide technology here. They're all in the other room, but they're available if you want one. The primary talking topic I'm going to be talking about this afternoon, there's a paper called Growing Trees for City Spaces how to build a better root system on the tree to grow in those, what I sometimes refer to as idiot holes. You know, those 24 inch square knockouts in the sidewalk. Anyway, there's a paper on that. The other paper that, that we'll get to here in a little bit in, in terms of the slides and further talk is entitled Seedling Development, the Critical First Days. You can modify if you do it right, you can change the root structure of a seedling on about day three, four, five, and it'll never be the same again. If you miss that opportunity, you can't go back. The I'm an old Kansas farm boy, went to Kansas State, still have a lot of family. Uh, my wife's got a lot of family up in this part of the world. And one of the problems that I, uh, as I was looking through various papers that I've written that I thought might be of help to you, I just stuck several in. This one says Johnson grass. You don't have any problem with Johnson grass, do you? 
Well, anyway, some aspects of control of Johnson grass. And it applies to other perennial weeds as well. So you're welcome to one of those if you'd like it. You know, I couldn't give a presentation without showing